All right. Um, I see this quoted more than any other single statement as a foundational, theoretical, methodological premise for the digital humanities. Um, another statement that I don't see quoted, but whose ideas I see everywhere, is one by Ed Ayers. The digital scholarship needs to do things that simply cannot be done on paper. That these two assumptions guide so much of, of, of what we do and, and what gets done. And uh, what I want to talk about today, what we are expected to do. Um, and, um, I, I have great respect for both uh, Ayers and McGann. I'm, uh, they both provided some early mentorship for me that I'm tremendously grateful for. Um, but I want to talk uh, about a teleology that, that I took from some of their early statements and that I think um, that affected some work that I've done and that I think affects work that other people do as well. Um, this teleology that um, both follows the pattern of the digital humanities and of individual scholars' careers, that we may start with creating an archive like the Rossetti archive or the Whitman archive or the vaulted fast that I've worked on. Um, but then the expectation is that's not enough. You need to make some kind of tool that will work with that material. It's not enough just to sort, organize, present information. And then those tools should generate new interpretations. This is McGann's imperative, that we should be making interpretive claims. So I, I internalized this teleology um, at an early stage in my career and um, began uh, working in 2004 on this project called uh, The Vault at Fafs, which is about the antebellum bohemians of New York City. Uh, Walt Whitman was a part of this group from about 1858 to 1862, 63. Um, really vibrant community, and, and the goal of this archive was to collect biographical profiles of about 150 of these people, uh, works by them, and just to understand them as a community and fill in their place in American literary history uh, out of which they had fallen. Um, but again, with this teleology in mind, I, felt, I thought this wasn't enough just to collect and archive these people and their accomplishments. We've got to create some tool some device to better understand the networks that they created. And so um, with Andrew Jewell of the University of um, Nebraska uh, and a computer scientist at Lehigh, uh, we got an NEH grant to do a project called um, The Crowded Page, um, which is a, would be a social networking tool um, to help understand uh, the social networks of, um, of historical communities. Um, the primary goals we had with this project were to um, develop tools for structuring data, create a visualization that would allow for serendipitous discovery of new knowledge. Um, that second piece there, the serendipitous discovery of new knowledge, that was our attempt to reach that state of interpretation. That we weren't just going to throw all this information up on the web and give this archive of, of individuals, but we were going to find a way to structure it and visualize it in ways that created new knowledge, that there are new interpretations would come from it. And uh, a third goal that we had was to um, this was the, the archival side of us, wanting to link that visualization we created directly to source documents so that you weren't just taking our word for it that these people were connected, but you could go immediately from a connection between two individuals and see um, here's the, the archival document that says that they're connected. Um, so we got this grant to create a proof of concept and we went on. Uh, Andy worked with uh, a group of the Greenwich Village Bohemians. Andy's the director of the Willa Cather Archive and his interest was with the, Willa Ca with the Greenwich Village Bohemians. Minor of the Bohemians of 50 years earlier. Um, so we went to the, the vault at FAFS and said, how can we take this information and structure it in a new way to show relationships between people? So here's a, a, a typical page of um, a source, um, a, an essay from Frank Leslie's popular monthly called The Bygone Bohemia. Um, and so we, we, uh, you'll see there's a person mentioned in each of these works. And we created an administrative interface. This is what a public interface, what you'd see if you go to the site. An administrative interface there off to the right-hand side. Um, so, boy, that's, that's annoying. Um, so here we'd have this person, Stephen Pearl Andrews. We see he's referenced in this work down here. He's a member of Ada Clare's Coterie of Bohemians. We had a place to input the relationship between Stephen Pearl Andrews and Ada Clare. We had a controlled vocabulary for defining, this, defining the relationships between people. Um, uh, be able to make an annotation that would, again, crucially link um, this relationship back to the source. And you, you go through the, the database that we have and you develop, I think you missed, there should be a circle, it should be coming up, there we go. Um, further relationships that Stephen Pearl Andrews has. He's an acquaintance of Walt Whitman, he's an antagonist of Horace Greeley. Um, and then the hope was uh, we would create um, 
this interface where you can pick different individuals from these communities, either the Greenwich Village Bohemians or the FAFS community, um, and visualize uh, the connections between them. Um, again, this was a proof of concept. It was unfinished. Uh, and we learned a number of things in this process. Um, we were really confident with the data model that we came up with, with the way that we were gathering information from our archives and structuring it and, and defining the relationships. We were disappointed with the visualization that we, that we ended up with. Um, it was difficult to work with. It flattened out different types of relationships. We didn't get the kind of strength that we wanted to be indicated by meaningful relationships versus those that were less meaningful. Um, Really tragically, we couldn't figure out a way to uh, reveal that source material, what that we really wanted to bring out from to the fore. And for those first three bullet points, what we really learned is design is not an afterthought. <laughs> you, have, you have a designer on board from day one. And this is something that Joanna Drucker talks a lot about, that it's not just coming in to, um, it's not staging the house to make it look nice. I mean, a, a designer is an architect. And if you don't have a designer with you on the payroll from day one, um, you're not going to achieve your goals. Um, that's something that we can work with, um, those first three points. We can keep moving forward. Something that really started to concern me was this, this fourth uh, point, that we, we, had these, um, we had this visualization, and in some of these we have much larger groups of people, um, but the actual space of FAF's bar uh, that, the, that the website is named after could only fit about 40 people at a time. And in working with these visualizations uh, that connected up to 150 people in, in different ways, we were creating the illusion that these people were always in constant contact. The kind of illusion that we're very comfortable with, because if you have a smartphone, you're always in constant contact with, with hundreds of people, um, potentially, synchronously, through Twitter or Facebook or, or other social media. And I was really starting to get concerned that we had um, imported a 21st century model of social networking to the 19th century. We lost an asynchronous piece, we lost a number of other pieces to it. Um, and in, in particular, the visualization that we came up with, the spider graph, is really ubiquitous. Here's a, my Google search, uh, I guess, the Google image search <laughs> of the phrase um, social network visualization. And you'll get thousands of, of uh, images like this. Um, there are lots of different ways that you can configure it, but there are a few basic forms that this takes. Um, and I'm getting concerned that those forms are already becoming hardened and codified, that when we think social network, we see something like these images that we have up here. So I'm eager to think, um, I'm moving forward, what might be some different ways to imagine that, even text-based ways of representing these relationships, um, kind of pulling back from that drive, drive towards the visual. So uh, Andy and I, we, we encountered these problems on the proof of concept, ready to move forward. Um, and then we hit a, a different kind of, of roadblock in our progress forward with, um, with the crowded page that has um, proved really intellectually generative to me. Um, Andy, as I mentioned before, is the director of the Willa Cather Archive. Right when we were about to start phase two of the crowded page, he was approached by the Cather family saying, we have all these letters by Willa Cather. We trust you as the curator of the Cather Archive to edit these. Will you please do these for us? They were looking to him as, as an authority figure. Um, and of course he said yes, and he did an amazing job um, with the collection. Um, at the same time, uh, a community of scholars had started using the vault at FAFs, and uh, we'd been having some panel sessions together, communicating, and there was very naturally arising uh, a collection of essays about Whitman and, uh, and the Bohemians that Joanna Levin and I edited for, um, here's my self-promotion, and, and get a bug. Um, edited for the University of Iowa Press that's coming out next fall. So Andy and I experienced something uh, we weren't prepared for. This teleology of archive tool to new interpretations took a different direction. The archives created scholarly communities, and then those scholarly communities created new publications in print. I mean, that's heresy for coming from, and I'm, and I'm making a straw man and a caricature of Ed Ayers that um, we should be doing things that can only happen in the digital realm. And there was a sense that, that we had failed in some sense, that our archives had just created more print scholarship. Um, and again, I, there's some rhetorical uh, effect that I'm, I'm shooting for here. I don't mean to, to make a straw man out of Ayers. Um, but this got me thinking about a concept that I, I've used as a, sh as a shorthand for thinking about this um, sidetrack that we took, this apparent sidetrack, of moving from archives, uh, digital archives, back to publications in print um, that I've been referring to as Moriarty's Code. 
which is the fantasy of a powerful digital tool whose work is, in reality, accomplished through a combination of digital and analog methods. And I get this from uh, the, the BBC Sherlock Holmes uh, Reichenbach Falls episode where um, Jim Moriarty comes in to the crown jewels and he has this iPhone app that he just touches and it opens up the crown jewels and there he is, he's, he's able to steal them. And a major plot point of the episode is that Sherlock Holmes has got to trace him down and figure out who, how do we get this code, this code is so valuable, it's precious. Um, it's, people are dying for it, people are killing for it. But then one of the plot twists is, surprise, Moriarty just bribed the security guards. <laughs> the code was all a ruse. Um, so no or very few digital tools were actually needed. Um, unless we think that this is just uh, a, a hacker trope in, in fiction or film, uh, there's an article a little while back about a Wired magazine editor um, who his uh, he was hacked, his email, his Twitter, his all kinds of uh, personal documents were hacked. And then the hacker outed himself to him and said, you know how I did it? I called the Apple support line and I pretended to be you. And they gave me all your information. Um, this, this is Moriarty's code. This idea that, uh, and, and I want to try to loop this back to the McGann and Ayers teleology, that if we're thinking what we're doing must be done digitally, we lose track of well, what is it that we really want done? You know, we want to mess with Sherlock Holmes and we want to mess with the Wired magazine editor. Do we have to do that through digital means? Not always. Is it failure to not achieve this through digital means? Um, I think it was uh, Chris Phillips who was saying earlier on, what kinds of questions are we asking and how do digital tools drive those kinds of questions? Uh, these are some concerns that I've been having um, as I internalize this teleology and saying how is that directing the questions I'm making and kind of predicting the answers um, rather than letting me see how are digital tools a means to an end. For me, that means, uh, that end is to bring the fast bohemians back into literary history. How am I going to do it? Well, some digital, some analog. Um, I, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, some guiding principles that have been helping me as I try to think this through. Um, Joanna Drucker has a great comment from her article in Debates in the Digital Humanities. Um, she asks, uh, can we engage in the design of digital environments that embody specific theoretical principles drawn from the humanities? not merely work within platforms and protocols created by disciplines whose methodological premises are often at odds with and even hostile to humanistic values and thoughts. Wh where do our questions start? Do they start in the humanities or do they start in, um, in the digital? And I know that's a false dichotomy we can deconstruct and break down, but I think this is an important question to keep in mind. Um, another one, uh, uh, Drucker's is a little bit more uh, pointed and antagonistic. Um, I'll end with Alan Liu who has uh, a greater sense of synthesis between digital and traditional methods. Um, uh, and I'll end on this, his comments. Digital humanities methods consist in repeatedly co-adjusting human concepts and machine technologies until the two stabilize each other in temporary postures of truth that neither by itself could sustain. And I'll end on that, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to talk to you today about the Wide Wide World Digital Edition, which is a project I've been working on for about the last five years. Really, I started as a, a graduate student, and it has gone through a lot of different evolutions over that time. Um, it fits well with our last conversation about Amy Earhart's work, thinking about women's recovery projects and their status. So just to let you know, this project has been up for a lot of NEH grants. and. Um, I've done some research in the last five years in the scholarly editions and translation grants. Out of 86 funded projects, only 11 of those had anything to do with minorities or women. So, wow. <laughs> so that's what this project has been dealing with primarily. Um, so Susan Warner's 1850 American domestic novel, The Wide Wide World, was a transatlantic success. According to Frank Luther Mott, Warner's novel sold 225,000 copies by 1860. Comparatively, Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter sold 11,800 copies, Charles Dickens' Bleak House sold 35,000, and Moby Dick sold less than 3,700, which we all know. <clears throat> By 1950, publishers in the US and the UK had produced 140, 141 versions of the novel, derived from 53 different sets of plates with over 47 sets of illustrations. I've been working with a team of scholars and students to develop the Wide Wide World Digital Edition, it's a project that visualizes how Warner's paradigmatic text shifted its cultural function and significance with each locale and material reproduction. 
Since the 1970s, scholars have studied the wide, wide world as a landmark example of 19th century sentimentality. And if any of you are familiar with the novel, you know that there's a lot of tears in the wide, wide world. In fact, one of my favorite copies of the novel at UVA has a quote in the margin that someone wrote that said, what a wet house. <laughs> but it's a beautiful book. <laughs> okay. Sentimentalism, broadly defined as the power of feelings to serve as a guide to moral conduct, was first understood as a rel relatively circumscribed phenomenon, chiefly manifest through popular novels written and read by women. Scholars have since uncovered its extensive reach across 19th century culture and are beginning to explore sentimental novels' interactions in an expansive transatlantic marketplace. The Wide Wide World Digital Edition challenge our, challenges our assumptions about the gendered and national boundaries of sentimentality through an exploration of the reprinting and reception of Warner's novel. Meredith McGill's American Literature and the Culture of Reprinting established the import of reprints for the formation of American culture. Through textual revision, editorial reframing, and the addition of illustrations, publishers feverishly reworked text for their audiences. McGill, though, focuses primarily on male authors, and she dates reprinting's um, demise at 1850 in her book, so the wide, wide world was actually reprinted all the way up until 1915. This project then explores how reprinting had an impact on a more diverse group of authors, readers, and publishers well beyond mid-century. I'm just gonna show you, this is one page. <clears throat> this is the part we're working on now because we're, we're trying to figure out some different tools for comparing visuals. We're really interested in paratext primarily. We do a lot of work with textual variants too, but um, paratext, especially the 47 sets of illustrations, are pretty important to our work. <clears throat> So the Wide Wide World Digital Edition offers a robust body of scholarship on transatlantic publishing and reception. It provides biographies of the most prevalent reprinters, galleries of the novel's iconographic illustrations, examples of the changing networks and technologies of the book trade, and case studies of the novel's revision sites. And we have material from over 22 repositories, and we'll have uh, unprecedented open access to editions of the novel, letters to and from publishers, and fan letters to Warner, some of which are already available on the site. <clears throat> so one of the things that we're really trying to think about is how do you portray a story of reprinting in a digital environment? These are multivocal revision sites, and they actively and even symbolically resist a stable meaning. And I'm gonna, just gonna show you a couple of um, different illustrations and covers for, through, I guess, 1853 all the way up until about 1920. So. Um, <clears throat> this first one is typical Ellen Montgomery, but in this case it's an 1853 British edition. She's churning butter here, and um, this particular publisher was really interested in immigration. It was at a moment in London when everyone was encouraging immigration, so Ka Catherine Chiswong, some of you might be familiar with her. Um, and this was actually a novel that was saying, you know, maybe <laughs> immigration is not the best idea. Uh, and then 1892, that's a Philadelphia Lippincott edition, and we have Ellen dressed in prairie dress, right, as there's a nostalgia about um, the end of westward expansion. This is one of my favorite ones from 1911. <laughs> uh, so this is Ella, um, Ellen and her mentor Alice, and um, it's interesting to me, 1911 is pretty late to portray women kissing as a sign of affection on a novel. Um, and this is actually a, an expurgated children's edition with large type, too. <laughs> it's really strange. And then this 1927 edition, where um, Alice and Ellen look like they're more prepared for, for Jay Gatsby's West Egg than their wall in New York, possibly. <clears throat> so all of these different revision sites indicate that class consciousness, gender identity, and conceptions of Americanness are central to Ellen's cultural redressing. These images are illustrative sites of what Lawrence Lessig calls remi remix culture. Lessig uses this term to describe the opportunities that digital media provides for users to embark on a new form of creative pastiche. But the wide, wide world's history of adaptation indicates that remix is anything but a new phenomenon. In fact, the novel itself explored the possibilities of cultural pastiche before reprinters adapted its text. How many of you have read The Wide, wide, wide World, just out of curiosity? <laughs> How many of you wish you hadn't? Are there some? <laughs> okay. So it gets a bit of a bad rap sometimes. <laughs> In the novel, Ellen develops into a proper Christian American woman through reading British religious texts adapted for American audiences by American reprinters. They're made personal for Ellen, though, through a surrogate family members that give them to her. 
So there's a King James Bible, the Pilgrim's Progress, and a book of British hymns. Um, she's therefore a product of the American appropriation of texts, and as she gives herself over to Christianity, she becomes a sort of metaphorical text. And immigrants in the surrounding community talk about how they can read her goodness, and they're frequently converted to her American brand of evangelicalism. So though she's not literally a book, the metaphor linking her Christian story to a readable text has powerful implications in the age of transatlantic reprinting. The British reprints of the wide, wide world, which transmitted Ellen's body across the ocean and into myriad British homes, became a debate about women's moral agency and responsibility, both within and beyond the domestic sphere. And so you can see here, these are three different cover designs, all of which are really obsessed with different scenes of travel. Globes, there are lots of watery expanses, lots of ships. Um, <coughs> so even as publishers work to supply a more diverse British audience with reading materials, they also responded to critics who evinced grave concerns that British identity was being undermined because the working classes, women and children were reading so many American books. As Leah Price argues in How to Do Things with Books in Victorian Britain, far from supporting an imagined community of readers, British publishers designed their books to reify class distinctions and codify an intended readership. British reprinters developed paratexts that simultaneously enticed working class readers and assuaged the anxieties of upper and middle class populations who acted as textual selectors for other members of their household. And Kate Flint's monumental study indicates that the awareness of Victorians and Edwardians to that discrete category of the woman reader and the hypotheses about her special characteristics as well as her presumed needs and interests affected the composition, distribution, and marketing of literature. So sentimental novels like Warner's were often designed to attract that particular group of readers, and there are key sites for gender-specific textual and material adaptation. British publishers were keenly aware of the novel's aims, and in their paratexts, Ellen's mobility is often a site of revision. So this here is T. Nelson's edition, and they typically reprinted British texts, um, I'm sorry, British religious texts, but in this case, they didn't go for the religious angle when they reprinted The Wide, Wide World. They're, they went through, um, they have all kinds of different illustrations of adventures. So we've got Ellen mounting the brownie, her pony, and then riding off at breakneck speed. <laughs> and that's compared in the same year to this illustration, which is much more focused on the domestic sphere. This illustration is from Clark Beaton. Some of you might know Beaton because he also produced the first Uncle Tom's Cabin in Britain. Um, so Beaton was, uh, he also, his wife was uh, Beaton's book of household management. So he was very involved in thinking about um, women's role in the home. In fact, um, most of his copies of The Wide, Wide World were made for really a lower class audience. And he even says in one of his descriptions that he is helping them elevate themselves. So, so he's thinking about those women, but he's also thinking about people who are buying books for those women. So. He quotes in one of his advertisements, too, from Catherine Beecher about the dangers of novel reading for women. <clears throat> Works of imagination might be made the most powerful of all human agencies in promoting virtue and religion, and yet through perversion, they are often the channels for conveying the most widespread and pernicious poisons. The havoc they often make in tastes, feelings, habits, and principles is ordinarily as silent and unnoticed as the invisible miasma, whose presence is never realized until pale cheeks and decaying forms tell of its fatal power. So novel reading is very dangerous to Beaton. <laughs> um, so Beaton hired an Anglican minister who in his um, preface for The Wide Wide World says, although he likes the novel, he's worried about Warner's vulgarities of speech. And uh, anyone who's read The Wide Wide World knows there's nothing vulgar in it. <laughs> um, and he opened with this frontispiece, which depicts Ellen um, saying goodbye to her mother for the last time, and her father is this sort of symbol of the public sphere kind of intruding in the doorway. These examples of textual remix from the 1850s demonstrate the myriad matrices of gender, class, and nationality that consumed the novel's reprints. This enduringly popular novel provides a rare opportunity for scholars and students to explore how representations of American culture at home and abroad changed over this 100-year period. The Wide Wide World Digital Edition investigates and annotates minute textual and visual adaptations across this one text corpus to reveal how women were framed as both the subject and the audience of sentimental literature. Although the trend in the digital humanities is moving toward using programming to interrogate voluminous textual collections, 
The Wide Wide World Digital Edition is primarily interested in the deep archaeology of the history of one text modification and remix. <coughs> and I'm hoping that even though the Wide Wide World might be a text that we don't always think of as the first thing we want to read, we can learn something specifically about what happens when it's reproduced in this way. So when I think about the archive, I don't, even though you can read a copy of the novel there, I think it's very useful just for looking at the paratext rather than having to be intimately connected to the novel itself. <coughs> as I hope this talk has demonstrated, the characters and settings of Warner's novel persist, but the text adaptation suggests that the wide, wide world was never a single book, but a consistently repurposed and reimagined space that can reveal a great deal about geographical distinctions, temporal shifts in the cultural understanding of feeling, and the evolution of the transatlantic market for print. Okay. Hi. So I am very happy to be here with you. I have a confession to make, though. I'm not an Americanist. I mostly study British literature. Um, but um, I work on both history, archival stuff, so I'm hoping to still be able to contribute to the conversation. Um, this paper today is drawn from my book project on romantic and Victorian commonplace books, and specifically how authors not only use the commonplace book tradition, but actively reinvented it to fit their own epistemological commitments and their own styles. Um, and these are just some examples of the commonplace books that I work on. Um, but today, I'm going to um, talk about, for the purposes of this conference, I'll focus my brief talk on questions of organizing archival material. How did 19th century writers engage with material culture from the past? I hope to show that the scrapbook emerged as a vital scholarly tool in the 19th century because it offered a vehicle to store material information. Not just the lines of a poem, um, as you can see these authors here writing out, um, writing out quotations, but the ink the poem was printed with, the typeface, the kind of paper, etc. And I'll focus on one author who I think you'll agree um, organized his archival information in, in a particularly violent way. So this is him, James Orchard Hallowell Phillips. He was one of the most prolific and influential Shakespearean scholars of the 19th century. But his career as a historian, biographer, and bibliographer started in a rather unorthodox manner when, as an undergraduate at Cambridge, he allegedly stole a book from Trinity College Library, a, a rare book. Um, later, he sold the book to a collector who, in turn, sold it to the British Museum Library. And despite Trinity's best efforts, it is still there today. Um, and you can see it in the Edgerton collection. So despite being banned for a time from Trinity and the British Library, Hallowell Phillips managed to publish upward of 60 texts about Shakespeare and the Elizabethan period. While doing so, he compiled over 300 scrapbooks filled with cuttings from the 16th and 17th centuries. Ephemera, printed books, manuscripts. Some of his collections are literally overflowing with scraps, so many, um, in fact, that he would often have to use a small nail to affix several to a page. All of his scrapbooks follow his methodology, which he describes as archaeological, because of its focus on un unearthing relics from the past better to understand the society that produced them. And he collected a lot of manuscripts, but he also was involved in digs um, at, around Newhouse and Shakespeare's birth house, um, and was responsible for preserving those houses as the museums that they are today. Within the pages of a scrapbook, a cutting from a manuscript or an early printed book enters a new network of meaning as it interacts with the other scraps surrounding it another kind of remixing, I think. Once pasted on a page, these scraps take on layered meanings. They gesture back to the text they came from, but they are also unhooked from, from that and um, enter into conversation with the other scraps that surround them. They are juxtaposed with different narratives, different histories, and different arguments. So when we look at a scrap like this one from Hallowell Phillips's collection, we might see a Victorian dismembering a Renaissance commonplace book, or we might see a scholar collecting evidence for his arguments about Hamlet. 
This cutting, I should say, comes from a series of 128 quarto-sized scrapbooks, um, so relatively small, that Halliwell Phillips compiled while putting together his sumptuous edited collection of Shakespeare's works, which came out in installments between 1853 and 1865. And he, he, upon his death, he donated these scrapbooks to the Shakespeare Center Library in Stratford-upon-Avon, where you can see them yourselves. The scrapbooks contain many cuttings from this particular commonplace book, though these quota quotations would originally have been grouped together according to traditional general topics, Hallowell Phillips takes them apart and rearranges them according to his own chosen organizational structure. Accordingly, he groups them by play rather than theme, and each scrapbook is devoted to a particular play. So obviously this cutting comes from um, one of the Hamlet scrapbooks. Thus, this quotation, which um, presumably originally appeared juxtaposed with other extracts related to remembering, which is the general topic that you can see at the top, it now resides next to cuttings related to Hamlet, many of which pertain to the cultural context of the play. And to give you two more examples, um, consider two cuttings from related to Ophelia's final scene in Hamlet when she speaks the famous lines, there's Rosemary for remembrance an association that Hallowell Phillips verified through research in texts from the Renaissance. He includes several scraps on, his, on this topic again, torn from the pages of old books. Here, Hallowell Phillips marks the keywords for his investigation, memory and rosemary, and writes the name of the text he extracted the cutting from, the castle of memory, and the Shakespearean text associated with the information it contains, Hamlet. And just another example from the same scene, Ophelia appears on stage singing, they bore him barefaced on the beer, hey non nani, nani, hey nani. In his search for the song's source, Hallowell Phillips pastes a cutting from the 1673 edition of Playford's Musical Companion, which includes a similar refrain. In their original function as commonplace book entries, musical scores, or medicinal advice, these cuttings were important for the content they contained. In Hallowell Phillips' scrapbook, they are also important for their materiality. They are the relics of Shakespeare's near contemporaries interacting with his works as well as his potential source material. What was once an intact commonplace book or early printed book became a collection of fragments in the service of Hallowell Phillips' method. His archaeological method and indeed his scrapbooks hinge on two seemingly oppositional actions, cut and paste. The two are a balancing act of destruction and creation, as the paste function rearranges the scissors' spoils and sets them within a new book, arranged according to a new method. Within the pages of a scrapbook, cuttings from a Renaissance commonplace book or an early printed book enter a new network of meaning as they interact with the other scraps. A well-designed scrapbook generates threads of thought and strings of narrative out of the scraps it assembles lending itself to publishable histories. And by publishing his findings in books that reproduce parts of his collection, Hallowell Phillips fed a public hungry for new material about Shakespeare's life and cultural surroundings. His writings underscore how the remains of Shakespeare's life are incomplete, and the fragments emerge as a mark of authenticity in his writing, simultaneously communicating a sense for the period that they come from as well as the ravages of time and their status as historical artifacts. Um, in the preface to one of his biographies on Shakespeare, he includes an image of the remains of New Place and explains, and this is a quote, that it is typical of the fragments of the personal history of Shakespeare, which have hitherto been discovered. In this way, his biography of Shakespeare begins to resemble his scrapbooks, filled as it was with images called in the service of his method. Hallowell Phillips goes to great lengths to describe these fragments as material objects. On another page, he describes um, one of the only remaining letters addressed to Shakespeare. Um, and he explains, and I quote, it is a very small document folding up in the exact size here indicated. His attention to bibliographical detail conveys a familiar struggle to approximate the experience of handling archival material. And it makes me think of the digital reproductions we're all familiar with, with rulers on each side to give a sense of scale that these rulers would not be necessary if you were actually holding the material in your hands. 
It is the irony of archival research that while we try to better understand a historical period by studying its material remains, we increasingly detach our evidence from their original function. The cut manuscript in Hallowell Phillips' scrapbook, or for that matter, in my PowerPoint slides, live another life as evidence for historical arguments. In an age of rampant digital, digitalization, it would seem that one of the most promising outcomes is increased accessibility to the scraps necessary for an archaeological method. But in closing, I want to suggest that the status of the fragment takes on renewed importance for us as our tools make it possible to frame documents in such a way that they seem complete when in fact they are not. I'm thinking of our conversations this morning completely cutting out marginalia and pretending that it was never even there, or putting up one edition of a book and forgetting the five editions that preceded it. Our digital archives are nothing if not fragmented. Even if the past comes to us as fragment, we don't always pass it on as such. This poses an age-old aesthetic question. How do we represent absence? And how do we represent incomplete information? And perhaps, I'll end by suggesting that maybe Hallowell Phillips offers us a lesson, not in the way we might collect archival material, obviously, but in how we choose to present it as always and importantly incomplete. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Tom Ackberry, and I'm a lecturer in the English department at Northeastern. And I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to talk about, my, my interest is in late 19th, early 20th century American literature and its engagement, its encounters with scientific discourse. And so one of my key figures is this fellow. Turn the microphone around. <laughs> microphone. Henry Adams. And uh, so I want to think about the, the sort of print culture that he offers to us to, for study. And uh, he wrote, it, Adams has an interesting uh, publishing history. Generally, he started as a journalist writing in the North American Review and then wrote as an academic historian. And then he wrote as a novelist and he published one novel under a pseudonym and another, another one anonymously. And the, student, the novel, the pseudonym he chose was a woman's name. And then after the turn of the century, he wrote the works I think we know him best for Mont Saint-Michel and Schaff and The Education of Henry Adams. And both of these books he published privately uh, in nice, nicely bound Moroccan leather uh, editions of about 100 or so for the, the, the education, for, for example. And he distributed these privately. And uh, so I want to think about that, that kind of circulation of text in, in relation to our questions about print culture and this sort of network that he has uh, on how he thinks about a re readership and public and what's prime. I think, uh, I think the uh, groups offer some interesting questions about that. So if we think about him in a, in a network fashion, we might think about, because he's printing these privately, he's deciding who gets to see this work or not, we can think about uh, how a network might, might work. The, uh, are things centralized or are they dispersed? Uh, uh, do we have sort of a, a total notion, control even of, of circulation, or do things become fragmented? I think that those kind of uh, tensions are tensions of the age, and uh, those of us who have read uh, the education, a show of hands, and, and who teaches it? Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. That was quite a difference, by the way, between those two. So. <laughs> if nothing else, I'll encourage you to teach the education. All right. Um, but it, of course, it, uh, Adams thought about those in his late works, that, that kind of tension between the, the unity of the medieval study, culture, you studied most of the structure, and the multiplicity that uh, we often commonly think of as dismaying in, in the education. Uh, so, uh, so how does this, how does this, how can we think about the model of this network and this private network? That's a question for us. And, uh, and and what? How does this, as, we, as, we, as we think uh, more in, in digital humanities about the circulation of text, viral distribution of text? It seems to me sometimes texts themselves almost have an agency, uh, a will of their own to to disperse. And I want to think about that in relation to this. That does seem to be perhaps centralized, another kind of distribution model. Uh, 
And I'm going to offer some text. I also want to think about one of the, the gaps that was proposed in the conference between the digital and the, the undigital or the, the pre before digital kinds of studies of, of literature. Uh, all right. So in control, it, so in, uh, so when Adams publishes the work privately, <coughs> And then, we, and this is so, it, he published late, I think December 1906, and February 1907, he started mailing letters and texts to his people who knew. And it's quite an astonishing list of people he knew. So this is one of, to Henry Cabot Lodge, this is one of the first letters he sent out. And you see a very terse letter, offering instructions about what to do with this text he's sending out. Let's see, I send you a volume in the proof sheets, which contains allusions to you and yours, which I wish you to, would glance at, and after running your pen through anything that seems to you personally objectionable, return the volume to me, and that's it. Uh, it's a very sort of, very conscripted way of distributing a text. And so he did ask for people to return that. As, as time passed on through 1906, uh, through 1907, 1908, these letters became a little bit longer. This is one of the first ones. Uh, so, what, so what is Adam thinking about when he puts a text out there, as it were? What's his notion of a reading public or a reading private? Uh, how do we think about those notions of his? And, and I think it, it, uh, it does show, this, again, this printing history, he published novels and under pseudonyms or anonymously. How does he think about the notion of authorship as well? What it means to get a, a book out there? Is he anxious about this sort of thing? Is he anxious of what? What does the public think about this? Yeah, let's, let me see if we can have some evidence of that. In other words, the people who weren't getting these privately distributed copies. So this is from the introduction to Mont Saint-Michel, the first time it got printed. Whoops. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's something else. <laughs> So this is so it was published in 1913. This is and he, he had distributed privately in, in 1904, and then as it, it, it did, people beyond the original private receivers started to share their copies, and so it did seem to circulate a little bit. And Ralph Adams Cram uh, was with uh, um, importuned Adams to publish it under the auspices of the American Institute of Architects. And one of the things he says is always. When it was shared, when the text was shown to him by Barrett Wendell, who's one of uh, Adams's graduate students in history at Harvard, I came first to know Mr. Adams' book, Mont Saint-Michel and Charger. I was profoundly convinced that this privately printed, jealously guarded volume should be withdrawn from its hiding place amongst the bibliographical treasures of collectors and amateurs, and given that wide publicity demanded alike by its intrinsic nature and the cause it could so admirably serve. So there's a notion of distribution that was at odds with Adams. He finally relented. He said, I'll, you know, I'll give you the rights of this, and you may can do what you want with it. Um, it's interesting, Cram's, uh, Ralph Adams Cram is a famous American architect of the, the teens and 20s. He designed the Cathedral of St. John of the Line, most of Princeton. Um, but so, there's, so there's a notion that there is a public beyond that that Adams was clearly not engaging with for whatever reason. But it's unavoidable. Um, so thinking about this, I decided to uh, make a little botanical drawing. You can't see all the, the edges, the little lines between the, the circles or nodes, but they're there. <laughs> I should. Um, but what is it? Uh, so this represents. So Adams is in the middle, obviously, and the circle, the concentric circles, represent the first receivers and the second wave or so of his text in 1906, from February to about I think April or May of 1907. So this is early times. So people he was still sending it to privately, and uh, you can start to see. I think you. You can start to see, as we get a little further in time, something is more more interesting than this sort of radial pattern, which you would expect. Right? There's one. There was one distributor at the center and just sending it out in this fashion. So, so this, is, this is with the labels of all these. So it gets a little messy. But this always uh, astonishes me, the names on this list. So one of the first pe pe people he sent it to was Theodore Roosevelt, who was president at the time. 
and both of the James brothers, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And so, th so thinking about if that is your reading public, well, that's a pretty good public. Uh, but again, how, how is he thinking about the distribution of taxes? Something that, that calls into question. I think it is called into question. But I think you see at the edges here now, I mean, at the, 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 the perimeter of this, of, the, of the, the diagram here, you start to see some other things. So there's, not, there's no direct line from Adams to some of these figures now. So the text is leaking out, and, uh, and there's even a little, little praying mantis that the sophomore put in there at the top between Richard Watson Gilder and Ferris Greensler. So Gilder was a poet and the editor of the Century magazine in New York, so a prominent literary figure. So Adams had sent him the education. And then he showed it to Ferris Greenflet, who was an editor at Houghton Mifflin in, in this time. Um, and then there is a line from Greenslet back to Adams, because as a publisher, then Greenslet wanted this text for Houghton Mifflin. So he wrote, and then Adams uh, tried to blow him off for uh, about a dozen years or so. But he wore him down. But let's, what was uh, uh, Greenslet thinking about? So Greenslet wrote an autobiography, and it got published. <laughs> so he talks about the, the first Hurricane Connor, he said, when, when uh, he was shown the text for the first time, he read it all night, took the first train down to New York, and then he knocked on Adam's door. And then, and then this, what, you see what ensued there. Uh, that I've just finished reading your education is one of the great books of the new century who Mifflin Company want to publish. And then, of course, then this is Adam's response, as Greenson tells us. And uh, he was unhappy with that, uh, that leakage of the text there. Um, So, so I want to think about, again, this, this sort of question about distribution of text and who's getting it, who's, who's your readership. And again, this sort of this elite privileged position uh, Adams occupies to get this text out in such a way. And that's, uh, that's uh, something for, for us to consider. So the last thing I want to show you is this uh, a letter from him. Uh, and Adams was sending out these texts from Washington, his home in Washington, and from Paris, his other home. Um, so this is a letter to one of his Taylor, uh, his, Taylor, one of his old, one of his old students, a bit later. And, and now you see after you know some of these, he's gotten some response to the text, and he's writing at this moment. And let's let's take a look at what he says here. Really, nothing matters. No one cares. In any other generation, the proportion of us to all will be as unity to infinity. I am satisfied that it is immaterial whether one man or a thousand or a hundred thousand read one's books. Thus far, I have never given a copy of the education to anyone. Again, as you saw that letter to, to uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, he wanted this returned, and very few people did. They did at the beginning. Roosevelt kept his, um, as you see here. Occasionally, some bandit, like Theodore Roosevelt, <laughs> has told me that I need never expect to see his copy again. But this is piracy and force majeure, Theoretically, other copies are to be recalled for the corrections, or as time goes on, I doubt more and more whether the volume is even worth correcting. It's, it serves its purpose, its only purpose by educating me, <laughs> which is a typical Adams line <laughs> there at the end. But I just want to propose it, that this, this is a, a, a kind of a, a very, very peculiar, very uh, rare kind of circulation of text. But, um, and eventually it did get published, and <coughs> posthumously through the Massachusetts Historical Society. But Adams was not engaging with that the notion of, of the public distribution of text. And I, did, I think that's interesting to think. And the little network diagrams, and I, I want to add more to that as, as the text got, went on. He, in some of his later letters, he does remark that in Europe, every important biography has a bit of my text in it, is one of his later letters, about a, uh, 10 years later. Hmm. So there is a notion that that is getting out there. He's resisting that for some reason. I think. That's what I wanted to bring to our attention. Thank you. I believe it's my task to start the conversation with the world rolling. And it's a challenging group, a wonderful group of papers. And 
that I'm just going to free associate off of him if that's okay. Uh, one free association, of course, is the the spiderweb chart, of yeah. course, which has come up in two, two of the papers. And um, I thought that was mandatory. <laughs> it was, and I don't know why they didn't get the, the message. Right, right. So I'm thinking, I mean, I think that Tom's use of it is rather different because he's showing a particular kind of network growing out of, you know, out of the Henry Adams thing. And, and in fact, it has many possibilities of, of using other colors to show exactly when everybody got everything. And, and that has many, many, you know, that really does illuminate something in a, in a very vital way about this private distribution, this sort of private distribution, or maybe you know, this rather coy private distribution. Um, and then, I, I, yeah, so, but I want to go back, go to uh, Ed's point that this is an, um, an emerging cliche, mm -hmm. the, um, the spider web chart, and I'm also free associating to the, the, the best known spider web chart that I, of, 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 of relative antiquity of the early 20th century uh, drawing of, of, you know, the, the, the right-wing drawing of, of the connections between socialists and feminists and, you know, and, and the, you know, how they were all trying to take down the government. Um, so what do these cliches, why are cliches a problem? They cause our brains to freeze, right? We don't think well when we're using a very familiar, when, when a pattern of thinking about something becomes too familiar. And in that vault that FAFs work and in the and then the social the other I'm sorry not the vault one but the other social Trump networking page. site of connecting up the Bohemians connecting up the Whitman segment it does as you say you can't fit all those people in the room so what did it actually mean for them to be part of a network but it reminded me of a novel from the 70s I think or maybe the early 80s called um, Zoe's book by Gail Pass I don't know if anybody knows it it's, I see one head nodding, okay. Uh, obscure readings wins. Um, <laughs> it's, it's about the Bloomsbury's. It's about, it's a, char it's a researcher character meets somebody in the garden at, at, the, at the British Library who claims to have known every member of the Bloomsbury Circle and in fact have been there, you know, has, has this is sort of the missing character from it all. And the, arch the, the researcher is completely seduced by this possibility that somebody really knew all these people and, uh, and, and is unknown and, and she's just, you know, drawn along and of course abs abstracted from her own research which she abandons in favor of this, hearing this much more seductive and interesting stories of this woman in the garden. But I'm just thinking, you know, that's a whole other way of understanding these social circles. It's, an op it's a way that opens up, mm -hmm. opens them up. I mean, it's obviously not scholarly in a sense, but it's also, it's, it's something about why those circles, why those networks capture our imaginations. They, they, um, they bring us to the idea of, of putting ourselves in them, for one thing, as they offer that possible little moment of thinking, you know, what would it have been like to be in the, in the FAFs? And I just wondered if we could think about, you know, is there a way that some of this digital work could either invite, incorporate, excite that same kind of imaginative process that welcomes us in and invites us to engage with it in a, in a more, um, you know, in another dimension, you know, that's, that the spider web maybe flattens out. Um, so that's one, one question, one, one point to bring up. Um, and uh, I was thinking also um, with, with Jillian's work that we're looking at, um, I mean, the scrapbooks I'm f I'm, I've spent more time focusing on are of printed material, of mass produced, and in fact, with the scrap, in, at least in the American context, scrapbook making takes off in a huge way uh, with the availability of mass produced print, cheap, cheap mass produced print, um, so that more people do it as, as long as, uh, if there's more to work with. Um, and, and, and then, of course, they're also collecting personal memorabilia, but that's a whole other category. Here, you're looking at somebody who is hacking away at, uh, you know, at, at unique objects in a way that we find a little more than, I think we find more than a little disturbing. It's sort of like you know, if anybody's been to the Marmiton Museum in Paris that has those manuscripts. Some wonderful American collector, I think it was, 
slice the really pretty pictures off of a lot of uh, medieval manuscripts, and he, he liked those parts best, so they're on display there. Um, so it has some of that feel to it, but on the other hand, it also has uh, participates in, in the great crowdsourced Wikipedia of the 19th century, which is, of course, the creation of the Oxford English Dictionary, mm -hmm. of the abstracting lines from so many different sources and reprocessing them and putting them in a completely different context where they become examples of, of usage rather than you know, a line in a play. Um, so he's not unique in that sense. I mean, he's part of that project. What he's unique in is, is or not unique in, but well, one hopes not <laughs> there, there weren't too many of him slicing up those commonplace books. Um, you know, but he's he's doing something. Let, let me set that question aside. You need, I mean, yeah, there could have been thousands of him. Um, but he's he's doing that in a way that values the actual piece of evidence rather than the index card. Mm -hmm. He's sort of doing Walter Benjamin's trick of the you know the sort of jokey scholar that he the, the scholar that he kind of jokey jokily imagines who you know, reads, would really prefer to have the book in, a in the form of a lot of index cards, mm -hmm. reshuffle them for his own book, and then he'll have his own box of index cards. So he's playing that trick, again, which is very familiar to our own digital ways of working in the present. Um, and, and yet, for him, that materiality is extremely important, mm -hmm. so that he's connecting all his, I mean, that those, anybody who's worked in the archives has seen slips connected with pins, in that way, it's a very familiar mode of working for, for, for many people at that point. Um, and of course, he's actually following in the footsteps of what earlier user note takers that Ann Blair tells us about, who did cut up manuscripts and paste them or pin them in different ways as they were working. So he's not so unique. He's just doing it in a point at a point when we are aware that that, that these might be precious things, <laughs> or one hopes he might have been aware of that, or the, and that he's distorting the possibility of ever, he's destroying the possibility of ever recreating their original context. He is not simply making a new context, but he's um, wiping out the old context. In, and the old context is a carefully constructed one, and there is only one copy of it, and he's already wrecked it. So, so I think those are very different issues than we deal with in the digital world. But in the digital world, we also lose the traces of where things came from because we, are, we so often work in fragments, because so often items start circulating as free, uh, you know, as free bits of text that are you know, freestanding quotes instead of being some, a passage that, uh, you know, that read the whole thing and then you actually, and maybe you underline it, but that's different from even putting it up on a PowerPoint slide as a freestanding text, where we no longer know what else was being said around it. So I think those are all issues that we might want to engage with, and I don't, and, and also to think too about the many, the many resources that as, as all these wonderful sexy ways of manipulating things and making and using uh, Web 2.0 to create relationships and to invite everybody in to make remarks about whatever we put on the web, that sometimes solid, wonderful projects like the wide, wide world can get sidestepped and uh, you know, shoved to the side because of those, and yet something like that is so valuable for teaching um, it opens up many ways of close reading, mm -hmm. a huge archive of stuff that you'd have to go, you know, I mean, even the, Antiqu Amer the American Antiquarian Society wouldn't have all of the materials you found, and that allows students to retrace the steps of the kinds of scholars like Kathy Davidson, who first started out, you know, heading to an archive, looking all the co at all the copies and trying to figure out what you might get out of that. Um, and you know, and offers it in small enough or in discrete kinds of, of pieces that, you know, look, being able to look at all the changing <coughs> covers from different eras allows. Um, I had another thought on that. But at the same time, uh, Wide Word World has become more accessible since we can read it on our tablets instead of having to carry all, how many pages? 
592 usually. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, there's, so there are many new opportunities that come to it as well that may also direct people to the site and maybe even will direct NEHF officers to it and perhaps they will change their mind on the next pitch. So other folks, yes, Heather. Uh, Hester, thank Hester, you. Hester, I'm sorry. No, no worries, it's coming. Um, thank you for this excellent panel and I, I wanted to uh, ask a question that um, builds off the commentary uh, about access. I was one of many with an intake and breadth of horror at the statistics that you, mm -hmm. Jessica, offered about um, NEH funding. And for all, of course, the promises that digitization can offer for expanded access, of course, the access to um, funding and to institutional and infrastructure support for making those kinds of projects possible is not always present. Um, and this is something that came up in, in Ed's work as well, the difference between trying to imagine a social space that was characterized by its intimacy and its smallness on a broad scale. And so I think my question is about access. The, the question that I had um, is, is one that um, I, I wanted to tip a bit towards professionalization in the sense that um, we, we had a, uh, for those of us in the discipline of English, there was a, a rash, a huge, a rash is an incorrectly um, <laughs> tilted word I didn't have. There was, a, there was a huge number of digital managed jobs last year. They shrugged down on the job list this year. Whether there's a pattern there or some reasoning uh, is far beyond my powers to identify. But I, I think that my own sense of how institutions work is often that there's a, a great interest without a proportionate um, commitment of resources, whether technological, infrastructure resources, money for it. Um, and I'm wondering for those of you who have been either encountering problems of access in your in the actual production of your scholarship versus, um, and at the same time as those of you who are talking about access in the content of the scholarship, um, how much you've had to pitch your own um, work your own conversations along the lines of these kinds of professional institutional questions um, and what opportunities there are there and obviously I think we can get some of the limitations. You know, I'll start uh, the McGann quote um, I started with. Um, I'm, I'm just going to read a section of, from it again that speaks to this professionalization. It says, humanities scholarship will not take the use of digital scholarship seriously. The, and he goes from there to saying we must build interpretive tools. So there's that, that moment of a panic and anxiety about the institutional viability of what we're doing. Um, and mm -hmm. along with that goes jobs for graduate students, goes funding for projects. Um, and, and again, McGann is a whole bunch of smarter than I am. And, I, and <laughs> I, I hate to make it seem like I'm making a straw man out of him. But that, that idea that this whole enterprise that we're embarked upon is, is founded upon that kind of anxiety. Is this even legitimate of, of what, we're, the, what we're doing? And then how do you present that legitimacy to people who hold the purse strings? I think one of the things that you were talking about Ed, that really struck me is the ways in which we frame our project around funding structures, which yeah. sometimes can be really helpful. Yeah. You start to think about it in new ways, and yeah. it opens up new questions, but sometimes can limit what you do, so That's that right. maybe you're not thinking about the content anymore. You're thinking about the tool as an opportunity to get the content out there, there. Yep. and then you lose all kinds of things you didn't realize you were losing in the process. Yeah. I agree. I'm just curious about a quick follow-up. Uh, we were talking about this at lunch, actually, uh, Alan and I and a few other people. Is this divide, this privileging, mm -hmm. that you're talking about a kind of recreation of the same privileging of this sort of monograph over the critical edition? Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean for Absolutely. a long time, right? The Absolutely. critical edition, despite being more widely yeah. used by scholars in the classroom, yeah. in their own research, was, was, no one probably would have said it this baldly, but it was lesser than yep. writing the monograph that was the kind of interpretive intervention, yeah. right? Is this just sort of a rehashing of that same divide? Yeah, and just a couple sentences before this, he says, you know, we can't just collect and organize things. And I just, well, why not? You know, and, and I think it, it, there's an institutional history that's behind it. I think there's also some anxiety of like, well, if we do that, then we're, then we're no better than librarians. <laughs> right? And like, how dare we? You know, so there's, I think you're absolutely right. There's an institutional history to it. There's identity um, anxiety behind it. I think Jillian's figure. Um, is very much doing something beyond librarians by collecting and organizing. You know, yeah. that there, there is an intent and a vision and a, a will there that uh, goes somewhere else. It's not that we need to go cannibalizing 
objects in order to recreate that, but I think there, there is something going there. But I also think that there's, it, thinking about what delegitimizes projects, one thing that Ellen said about Jessica's project, that th this would be so great in the classroom, it's probably the second strike against it. Not only is this about women authors, <laughs> but it has an obvious pedagogical application, which the NEH does not like. Yep. Um, and so thinking about, you know, that you have to reinforce the canon, you have to reinforce scholarship, at the expense of the classroom mm -hmm. in order to get certain types of funding is, you know, I think, part of the game that we have to struggle against uh, in some way or other. Well, although I would say that you know, on my campus at NYU, there's been a lot of discussion about technology and mass education and the whole MOOC thing, which yeah. by contrast is very much, they don't want to hear about scholarship. It's all about teaching and the undergraduate experience and you know, how to, how to respond to that institutional mm -hmm. panic about, mm -hmm. you know, um, why should people keep paying for in-person in education, as they now call it. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, but it seems to me that, um, you know, one, it's one thing, one possible strategy to think about, given sort of recalcitrance of some of the traditional DH institution funders, um, to teaching and to thinking about pedagogy is to is to try to think about how these seemingly separate conversations are are potentially part of the same conversation, right? That a lot, you know, how might teaching be research led, right? Mm -hmm. That that you know what we can be doing in our classrooms in terms of disciplinary training and thinking about new methods and practices is is building projects, but not building projects in order to keep on, on the model of the interpretive monograph, which is going to sit there as, you know, um, as an achievement to scholarship, but that's going to be building scholarship and service training graduate students, undergraduates, and engaging them in collaborative research projects, right? Um, I don't, I haven't, that doesn't seem to be, you know, quite the category that people have been, I've seen being funded, but I think I'd love to see that you know, these institutional resources move in that direction, because I think it would help address some of these, these issues that you're, you know, you're raising about the institutional, um, well, about these, the privileging of these, of these institutional genres of, of uh, scholarship. Translation question. Yeah, it's a translation question, that's right. I, I thought that the, um, and I just loved your story about mm -hmm. the, um, the sort of interruption uh, going back to, uh, print community from the digital community. And, and I guess what I liked about that, um, I mean, I, I thought I thought that is actually a wonderful account of the effectiveness of the digital scholarship okay. rather than <laughs> the opposite. And so one of the things that, that what you're saying does is it, it sort of dislodges this, you know, let's call it a Whig narrative of uh, <laughs> digital humanities um, as being the, somehow uh, the, the grand arena of of progress, um, which it 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 can be and it cannot be, right? Um, it, it, so that, you know, there's nothing intrinsically progressive about the digital, um, and the so th what's cool about your narrative, though, is the fact that you were kind of tracking this community in um, this Bohemian community in New York. And, and in so doing, you generated a contemporary community, right? You generated a co community of scholars who had so much to say to each other that they needed to write a book, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and, and that actually seems to me precisely the hallmark of success, because yeah. one of the dangers of digital projects is that you build all this stuff and nobody looks at it, and nobody uses it, or you, you, know, you, get, you get so, and this is a version of getting so caught up in the tools and the structuring and so forth that the kind of scholarly questions fall out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So so why shouldn't the scholarly <coughs> questions jump back and forth? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean that to me so, makes total sense mm -hmm. and, and in a certain way what could be better than thinking about the generativity of um, the digital for um, I mean this is like the for creating these these new communities. It's like the MOOCs, it turns out that the the MOOCs that really work are the ones where people meet face to face, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, yeah. so that there's another sort of Moriarty principle yeah. for you, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, but I, I, I actually, 
I, I just want to say how much I thought that that was a, a compelling narrative of the way, the positive ways in which digital scholarship could work rather than some implicit failure of it. I mean, it's, we know this is how media operates. You know, for editors mm -hmm. to say, we have to do things that can't be done on paper, um, just elides the way that different media forms always interoperate. Mm -hmm. I mean, television didn't get rid of radio. Mm -hmm. The internet hasn't gotten rid of television. In your example, a print and manuscript are interoperating. That's just how media works. Mm -hmm. um, so the sense that we've come up with the media, I love the Whig narrative that we have, uh, that we have the media now and everything should funnel into it, it doesn't have to be right. But it's interesting that you didn't say take it to a commitment to an open access publication. I'm interested that you would take it back to an analog source instead of saying, actually, we are making a commitment to move everything yeah. in a certain direction. And I'm curious if that's institutional, that your authors need credits from yeah. their universities to get tenure, and that you're actually, in some ways, complicit in the system. Again. To, to be continued, go, go, look on, go look on the Whitman archive. That They have a lot of full-text monographs. Check how many of them are University of Iowa Press, just to be continued. Okay. That's all I'll say. Natalie. <laughs> um, well, so I, Kind of in that, on that question of sort of the media and how you know sort of the, the operations of media, right? That um, and thinking about the back to the the visualization of uh, interconnections, right? That spider graph, yeah. right? You know, I think the lesson of it was maybe important and not necessary, but is losing its necessity that knowledge doesn't operate hierarch hier hierarchically, mm -hmm. or information doesn't operate hierarchically, doesn't uh, move hierarchically, mm -hmm. or in a kind of linear fashion most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Tom Standage has just written this book about ancient social media, right? Ancient viral texts, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, that we're operating under the sign of the virus, right? <laughs> but then what's interesting about Tom's uh, use yeah. of that graph in the Henry Adams, it, you know, in terms of Henry Adams sort of uh, very controlled distribution of, of that text is that what you end up with is a graph that really resists, or the representation of a resistance to mm. the viral. Mm. And that nice. raised some, you know, I, I mean, I, I think there's some really interesting things to explore there about then, you know, you know, we think about, you know, publication is good, <laughs> you know, like that circulation is good, right? Like that, that non-hierarchical spread of information is important. Yeah. But, um, you know, and that's why, you know, and we want things to have open access. But thinking about resist, like what, what use resisting that movement might have was really interesting to me, right? Uh, Henry Adams, I mean, Henry Adams is sort of a patron saint for literature and technology. So I, I think thinking about resisting, him resisting that is really interesting. Yeah, it's very, very peculiar. Yeah. It goes against, you know, the kind of virtues take one's place. Yeah. But at the same time, he does, his, he does have a pretty good public in the sense that he is, his text is getting out there. Yeah. Very conscribed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, somebody wants to write anything here. <laughs> <laughs> Party's over. The good news is that the next event is the reception where you can continue to have these conversations.